Hello everyone, welcome back to Dagin Cuts. So today we'll be taking a look at problem A4 of the part num 2024. So this is a continuation on the series of videos that I'll be doing on the part num 2024, which is a contest for undergraduate students in the US. So this is a really interesting number theory problem because it's a bit unconventional and even though it involves quite a bit of steps, it is actually possible to motivate your way to the full solution. So without further ado, let us take a look at this problem. So the problem statement is as follows. Find all primes p greater than 5, for which there exists an integer a and an integer r satisfying r between 1 and p minus 1 with the following property. The sequence 1 a a squared dot dot a to the p minus 5 can be rearranged to form a sequence b0 to b p minus 5 such that bn minus bn minus 1 minus r is divisible by p for all n between 1 to p minus 5. Okay, so if uh, you are like me, this problem statement probably just blew over your head. It's actually a bit hard to digest it on first reading. So, I am going to try and break it down for you first. So what you need to do is basically first understand what is this property talking about. So what this property is saying is that when you have your sequence 1 a a squared dot dot to a p minus 5, it can be rearranged into another sequence. So these are all your powers of a, they become rearranged to a different sequence which are your b's such that the difference between consecutive terms are all congruent to the same r modulo p. Yeah, so that's why the con the consecutive difference minus r is divisible by p. It's basically the same as saying all the consecutive difference are modulo to the same remainder r. And you need this r to be actually not zero. It's from 1 to p minus 1. So now, Basically, the problem is you need to find all price p such that you can find some uh, powers of a like this up to p minus 5 such that you can rearrange them to have consecutive differences having the same uh, remainder under mod p. Okay, so hopefully that is clear enough uh, after the rephrasing. So let us now take a look at the solution. So I'm going straight into the solution because it's actually uh, quite intuitive to motivate the next step as you discover the solution. Yeah, so right off the bat, what you might do is p greater than 5, you always want to try the smallest case and see if you can get a better understanding of the problem. So for the case p equals to 7, what do you have? Well, you can try and explore all possible sequences that you can generate and see what happens. So over here, obviously only uh, mod p matters. So I'm going to write 1 a and a square for all possible uh, values of a. So 0 to 6 and see what happens. So over here, I have the seven different possibilities. And what you want is you want to be able to rearrange so let's say uh, this is uh, an answer that works. You want to make sure that you can rearrange them so that consecutive differences have the same remainder. Okay, so note that 1, 1, 1 doesn't work even though the consecutive differences are all remainder 0 because your remainder needs to be not 0. But thankfully, this solution works. So a equals 5 works because you can rearrange this to 4, 1, 5, and the consecutive differences are all modulo 4, uh, uh, congruent to 4 mod 7. So p equals to 7 works, and the solution is given by a equals to 5, r equals to 4. Okay, how about the next case p equals to 11? So it turns out that um, there's not going to be any other solutions, but when you explore p equals to 11, you will gradually inch yourself towards the proof on why there's no solutions. So let's take a look at the case p greater than or equal to 11, and all my diagrams are going to be 
drawn for p equals to 11 just for illustration, but the proof works for all p greater than equals 11. So let's think about what happens in general. You have your powers of a, 1a a squared dot, 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 and the reason why I did not just stop at the p minus 5 and continue all the way to a to the p minus 1 is because you know that by Fermat's later theorem, a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. So your cycle is definitely going to be a to p minus 2, and then you'll repeat again, uh, not a, 1 to p minus 2, and then you'll repeat again, 1 to a to p minus 2, and so on and so forth. But what you are interested in is only up to the p minus 5 terms. Okay, so we know that you have your, you have a possible um, pattern, then you throw away the last three terms. Okay, now some of you might argue that it is possible for a smaller power of a to be congruent to 1. You know, their cycle need not be of length p minus 2, uh, need not be of length p minus 1. And what I'm going to argue is that actually that is not possible. If there's a solution, a must be a primitive root. And why is that so? Well, if you have, uh, what, what is a primitive root in the first place? So a primitive root basically means that uh, the order of a is p minus 1. So that means when you take look at the powers of a, right, the first time it repeats back to the power equals uh, to 1 mod p is when a is raised to the power p minus 1. Now, if it's not a primitive root, it means that the order is something smaller and it must divide p minus 1. So then it will be at most p minus 1 over 2, which you can show is less than or equal to p minus 5, the cutoff. So 1 would have appeared again in your sequence before you even reach the throwaway terms. So it will appear at least twice among this sequence here. And that is a problem because if you rearrange it, rearrange the powers of a into your b's, then you will have 1 appear twice. And this means that if you have that, and the successive difference are all um, congruent to r mod p, then s times of r will bring you from 1 to 1, which means s r congruent to 0 mod p. But s, the number of gaps here is definitely less than p, r is from 1 to p minus 1, this is not possible, so there's no solution. You cannot have the same number appear twice among your b's. Okay, so we have just learned that a must be a primitive root, which means that indeed your numbers from 1 to a to the p minus 2 are all distinct. There's no cycle back, no smaller cycle. Then a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 and so on. Okay, so what you have then is that this is 1 to p minus 1 in some order, but you drop the highest three powers because you are only interested up to a to the p minus 5. Okay, p minus 2, p minus 3, p minus 4, you are interested in a to the p minus 5. So that is a useful understanding. Now you have a better understanding of sort of how these terms look. Although you can drop uh, three terms, it seems that you don't really understand how these three terms look like. But I claim that you do understand a little bit because the three terms you drop are basically a inverse, a inverse square, and a inverse cube. You see a to the p minus 1 is congruent 1. So a to the p minus 2 is basically congruent to a inverse. So if I call this c, basically you're dropping c, c square, and c cube. So the three terms you drop also have a nice structure to them. And moreover, if a is a primitive root, then a inverse is also a primitive root. Yeah, this is quite easy to check. The power of a inverse must also be p minus 1. Or rather, the order of uh, a inverse must also be p minus 1. So, you are dropping a primitive root c, c square, and c cube. Okay, so we have learned quite a bit about the structure of this a to a p minus 5. Let's now 
turn our attention to the structure of the bees. So if let's say there is a valid solution, how would the bees look like? Well, the bees need to have equal uh, consecutive differences when look under mod p. So one example is it may look as look like this. So let's say r equals to three just for concrete illustration. Then here are the terms. Uh, when I have p equals eleven, right? You see that they are all difference of three. The common difference here is three. So you have like 1, then 4, 7, 10, 2, 5, 8, 0, and so on. And you can have the other direction also, 1, 9, 6, 3, 0, and so on. Now, so this obviously uh, goes on and on. Uh, when you hit 0, to just before 0, that's one cycle. And then you repeat again, 0, 3, 6, 9, blah, blah, blah. And what you want is um, these terms, a to a, to the p minus 5, or rather 1 to a to the p minus 5, must take up one consecutive block along this chain. Okay, so maybe like from um, 3 to 10, or 6 to 2, and so on. So if uh, a valid solution ha happens, it must be a consecutive block along some r chain. Okay, now there are a few things you can do to limit the possibilities. Why do I only consider these four possibilities? Obviously, there are many more consecutive blocks I can look at. But notice that one is among the uh among the numbers here. So your consecutive block must contain one, and you know that zero is not among any of these numbers here. So zero is definitely excluded from the consecutive blocks. So this is why even though I have, uh, I think 10 possible starting locations, in the end, there are only four candidates in this picture because I cannot include zero and I must include one. Yeah, so now you have a better understanding of the possible candidates for B and you have better understanding of the structure of A. Then the question is, can I match structure of A to possible candidates for B? And you might think this is still too little information because uh, in general, I'm going to have many terms here and I'm going to have many options here. But you can flip your perspective around by looking at the terms that are being dropped. So instead of looking at this as the possible candidates for B, you can look at the possible candidates of the terms being dropped. So firstly, you notice that your consecutive blocks for B, right? It must be starting somewhere after zero and ending somewhere before the next zero. And you, when you look at the consecutive sequence of uh, terms that you can have for B, you will be dropping three terms as well. So in order for your uh, possible candidates to be consecutive, you can either drop the first three terms or drop the first two terms and the last term or drop the first term and the last two terms or drop the last three terms. You see what I'm talking about? Because from a zero to the next zero, there are p minus one options. Here I have p minus one options and I'm dropping three terms. And I want the remaining terms to form consecutive circles here. So I must be uh, dropping over here, either from the head or from the tail of both head and tail. So this is a lot more tractable because now you are looking at three terms here and three terms here. No matter what P is, you are always dropping three terms here and dropping three terms under B. So the question then becomes, can I, uh, is it even possible for me to have uh, the terms drop here be of the form C, C square and C cube, where C is a primitive root? Okay, so let us then brute force and check. So you, you saw earlier that there are four possible cases, right, of dropping terms from the head or tail. So in the second and third scenario here, I'm dropping 
uh, the head and the tail. So the head is R and the tail is minus R. So under the third and second and third scenario, I'm dropping R and minus R. So is it possible for the for two of the terms among C, C squared and C cubed to be R and minus R? This means that two among C, C squared and C cubed must sum to congruent zero mod P. And you can just that uh brute force check the three possibilities. So can you have zero congruent to C times one plus C, zero congruent to C times one plus C square, zero congruent to C square times one plus C? Well, the answer is no because C is a primitive root, so C cannot be zero. C cannot be minus one because then C square will be one. Uh, and C square the the power two is too small if C is a primitive root. And then similarly, C square cannot be minus one because then C four will be congruent to one, and four again is too small for the order if C is a primitive root. Okay, so in this case, we know that it is not possible. So we are now left with the other case where you either drop from the head three terms or you drop from the tail three terms. So you drop r to r or three r. Now notice that if I drop from the tail, I'm dropping minus r minus two r and minus three r. That is basically the same as r to r and three r, where I define r to be minus r. So case two will cover the remaining uh, scenarios. And over here, you can just brute force check. So can I have c c square and c cube be among r to r and three r? Well, I just check all six possibilities. It's actually quite easy to check because uh, you basically use the observation that c times c cube is c to the four, which is c squared squared. So the two uh, terms c and c cube multiplied together must give you the other term squared. So in this case, if this scenario is being considered, then three r squared congruent to two r quantity squared. And because r is co-prime with p, then this means 3 congruent to 4, which is not possible. So you can go through the exact same reasoning for the other 5 rows. You get uh, 2 congruent to 9, which is uh, not possible if p is already bigger than 7. And similarly, p is uh, bigger than 5 here, so this is not possible. So all these are not possible, which means that there is no solution. So that is quite a journey. And the proof is a little complicated, but I would say if you explore what you can learn about the A's and the B's in a natural way, you will be able to reach to the end of the solution. So what do you think of problem A4? I think it is a suitable problem for the fourth problem in part number 2024. Nice little number theory, and I'll see you in the next video.